Good day, everyone, and I'd like to welcome you all to uh, the joint RAL CGD seminar. Um, so today hosted, uh, hosted by uh, us in RAL. My name is Jared Lee. I'm a project scientist here in RAL. Um, and first, just a couple of housekeeping details. Um, so we'll be taking questions uh, both from here in the Zoom room and on the webcast. So if you're in the Zoom room, uh, we ask you to please use the uh, raise hand feature, um, uh, which you can see at the bottom of the, the, the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of the screen. Um, and if you're on the webcast, uh, below the webcast video, you'll see a Slido form where you can type in your questions. And so we'll be taking questions from, from both the Zoom room and the Slido. We'll be monitoring both. Um, also, if you are interested in uh, giving a RAL seminar, please contact me. Uh, you can Google the RAL seminar series webpage to find um, an upcoming schedule, which is currently wide open, uh, and also um, my contact information and recordings of previous RAL seminars. And so without further ado, um, I'm gonna hand things over to Tim Giuliano, who invited our speaker today. So Tim, take it away. Thanks, Jared. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Tim Giuliano. I'm a project scientist in RAL. Um, I'm delighted to um, have Stefan speak today. Um, Stefan is currently the regional modeling lead at the UCLA Center for Climate Science, where he collaborates closely with Alex Hall, among others. His research focuses on dynamically downscaling CMIP6 GCMs across the western US using WARF. Prior to joining UCLA, initially as a postdoc, Stefan received his uh, bachelor's and master's in meteorology from the University of Oklahoma, where he explored the applicability of an advection correction procedure in improving trajectory accuracy around an idealized supercell. So quite a bit different from, from what he's researching today. Um, he then received his PhD in atmospheric science from the University of Wyoming, where he explored the weather, climate, and hydrologic impacts of black carbon and dust on the South Asian monsoon and across the Western United States using regional modeling framework, uh, WARF-CHEM, and a global variable resolution modeling framework, CESM. And when Stefan's not busy with work, he likes to cook, wash dishes, play soccer, and storm chase. And his nickname is apparently the storm chase genie. Um, and to, to wrap it up, his favorite color is green because it's the color of life, spring, and severe weather season. So with that said, I'll turn it over to Stefan. That sounded considerably more boring when I sent it to you yesterday. Oh man. Um, thank you so much for the intro, Tim. Uh, and thanks to the folks at RAL and CGD for hosting. Um, and uh, before I, I get started, I just have, a, have to throw a, a shout out to my supervisor, Alex Hall at UCLA, uh, as well as Zach Lebo at the University of Wyoming. Um, without their enthusiastic support, um, I wouldn't even be thinking about doing uh, this kind of work. So, um, uh, and then I will just throw a blanket thank you to so many more who are uh, either working with the data or who are uh, contributing in some way, shape or form uh, to this uh, overall project. Um, and uh, I really want to focus on the, the subtitle, what the heck are we looking at as far as dynamical downscaling and, and climate change? Um, dynamical downscaling, as we'll get into in a moment, uh, is, is a process by which we generate high resolution climate change projections, uh, in addition to other types of high resolution data sets. So I think that uh, certain questions need to be asked uh, as far as technique. Uh, so that we can really uh, refine our, our approach to downscaling and, and produce a more precise product. Uh, and so there's just a picture of Alex and Zach, uh, because I think pictures are very important in this day and age, this virtual world in which we live. So just a forward, um, this is a general outline that we'll kind of follow. We'll begin with the motivation, why and how we downscale. Uh, and then uh, Building on that, uh, I will assert that we need to downscale more and we need to downscale more right now. Uh, and then uh, the bulk of the talk will focus on our team's efforts on the dynamical downscaling side of things. Apologies for the noise, those are two of our cats. Um, and uh, the, this, uh, our team's efforts have, have really focused on, on two overarching uh, areas. One, uh, dynamically downscaling uh, a reanalysis over a, a large historical period. Uh, 
Uh, and then two, we'll spend quite a bit of the talk looking at the downscale GCMs, uh, and we'll look at the, the technique uh, and uh, approaches to dynamical downscaling that may yield different uh, results, uh, such as bias correction used in downscaling, uh, as well as comparison to more traditional downscaling approaches uh, in simulating the future climate. Uh, and then I'll conclude with our vision. So before we describe wh uh, why and how we downscale, we need to get into the what uh, is downscaling. Uh, and so simply put, downscaling is a procedure by which we take uh, low resolution patterns and variables characterizing weather, weather and climate uh, and statistically or physically transform them into high resolution patterns. Uh, and so this process is kind of shown uh, in the figure on the right, uh, this color fill is showing uh, future changes in precipitation from one of our downscale GCMs. Uh, as we go from the raw GCM and we zigzag our way all the way down to a convective permitting three kilometer grid uh, via dynamical downscaling. Uh, but in this process of downscaling, whether it's statistical or dynamical, uh, the process always begins with uh, data from a GCM uh, or from a reanalysis. And there are different types. Um, which I'll go over. Uh, so just kind of keeping the schematic on, uh, on the right in mind, uh, we begin with the GCM or reanalysis, and then we're trying to approximate reality, which is the bottom slice in this figure. Uh, and our final product is just that, it's an approximation of reality. And we use the downs some downscaling conduit by which to arrive at our approximation. On the dynamical downscaling side, the GCM outputs are used as input uh, to drive a regional climate model, such as WARF or REGCM. Uh, and then the governing phys physical laws are used uh, to integrate a dynamic solution, hence the name. Uh, whereas statistical downscaling um, relies on uh, established statistical relationships that are built between large scale predictor fields uh, and high resolution predict dams. Um, and these models must be trained. Uh, and uh, in doing so, they're, they're oftentimes trained on some high resolution, or at least the relationships I mentioned are, are constrained by observations. And so, if you're looking at a statistical downscaling product over the historical period, you'll oftentimes see historical biases that are lower uh, than those you would see in dynamical downscaling. Um, so uh, here's a Venn diagram showcasing the strengths uh, and some of the weaknesses in bold of the various methods. Uh, so, and, and this will be important uh, later whenever I'm talking, when I talk more about our vision and where I'd like to see this overall project go. Uh, statistical downscaling is, is really awesome and it's really powerful because it's, it's computationally cheap. Uh, therefore, it can be used to downscale whole ensembles of GCMs or global climate models for multiple emission scenarios uh, and for multiple realizations. However, um, little physics is used as, in, as is implied in the name. Um, and there are what are called stationarity concerns. So those statistical relationships uh, between the large scale uh, fields uh, and the predict dams, uh, those uh, how they hold up in the future climate remains an area of, uh, of concern, and those are referred to as uh, stationarity issues. Meanwhile, on the dynamical downscaling side of things, well, they rely on physics to get at the result. Uh, while that may sound attractive, uh, as we'll see later, um, if you mischoose uh, your physics uh, and otherwise grid options in your regional climate model in dynamical downscaling, you can get a really bad result. Um, and also another weakness, uh, or I wouldn't call it a weakness, but a limitation of dynamical downscaling lives in the data availability issues. So it takes a very certain set of data to drive uh, a regional climate model uh, at sub-daily uh, sub frequencies. Uh, whereas uh, statistical downscaling doesn't really have to, to use that. It can rely on daily, uh, daily observations, or excuse me, GCM output. Um, and so I assert that we need to downscale more and we need to downscale now. Uh, so without going down the list in the interest of time, um, I'll just say that, that we're living in a climate change world. Um, weather phenomena uh, that are emerging uh, from uh, as we uh, enter a new climate regime or an ever-changing climate regime uh, that are shattering records. Um, and uh, an example, of course, is the, the unprecedented drought across the Western US, uh, this mega drought as, as it's being coined. Um, and um, so it's not a question of when we downscale, it's a question of where we downscale. Um, and um, again, as I mentioned, uh, climate change is uh, already, and the anthropogenic uh, fingerprint as it's being referred to is already emerging in our daily weather. Uh, and if we're considering this figure on the right, which is just a simple elevation map between an average GCM on the left uh, and uh, a higher resolution regional climate grid on the right, um, uh, we can see that uh, if we're interested in uh, 
what's going on in San Francisco and how it compares to what's going on in the Central Valley adjacent to San Francisco, which are which live in the same grid cell, um, we're not going to get the where right if we're if we're considering subsynoptic spatial scales uh, in 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 climate change projections. Uh, so uh, right, I assert that the where is not good enough, and we need to improve it. And there are a lot of wonderful efforts out there to do so. Um, but um, and so, so this leads me into, into the thesis of this overall work in which we are dynamically downscaling uh, global climate models reporting to the latest iteration of the coupled model inter comparison project or CMIP6 uh, down to what I'm calling landscape scales, nine or three kilometers. Um, and the last part is extremely important here. Um, we're being selfish and we're only downscaling uh, across Western North America and we're prioritizing the Western US. This is a disadvantage compared to in a cortex, for example. Uh, where you have to meet certain grid requirements uh, encompassing the, the whole of North America for, for it to be Cortex compliant, among other rules. Um, and uh, among things of interest, uh, so of course we're interested in quantifying the climate change uh, signal in terms of the mean and the extrema, uh, but also I'm interested in this idea of uncertainty quantification. Um, and so this figure on the right uh, from Hawkins and Sutton 2009, I think ages quite well, um, even though it's 12 years old, uh, these are still the three main sources of uncertainty in our climate projections coming from internal variability, uh, the model, the GCM we're considering, or the emissions scenario. And, and I would love to see, and I guess this is kind of the overall uh, goal of mine, is to develop such figures uh, that could resolve Appalachia or the Rockies or the Great Plains of the United States, uh, where you're actually you know, quantifying uncertainty uh, uh, at landscape scales. Uh, and so um, that's kind of our mission. And to that end, uh, we are using the Weather Research and Forecasting Model, or WARF. Uh, and um, across this domain here, uh, as shown on the right across the Western US, um, a 45 kilometer grid uh, is uh, used to drive nine kilometer, uh, a nine kilometer uh, simulation within which sits two convective permitting three kilometer simulations. And this is all via one-way nesting. Um, to prevent model drift, we spectrally nudge uh, the horizontal winds, uh, temperature and geopotential uh, above the boundary layer on the 45 kilometer grid, grid although no nudging is employed uh, on, in any of the other grids, any of the interior grids. Um, and then just one final note without boring you too much on the technical details, uh, but um, to simulate you know, large timescales, uh, you know, 120 year periods for the GCMs, we're parallelizing the years. Specifically, each, in, each year is considered and integrated discreetly from one another, uh, from one August through one September of the following year. So a 13 month chunk. Uh, and the first month in that chunk is chopped off as spin up. Uh, and so this allows us to simulate a 70 or 120 year simulation in the same amount of time as it would take to simulate one. And I, I just might add that we're varying CO2 and, CA, and methane concentrations uh, in the long wave uh, component of, our co uh, of WARF. Uh, so um, for the remainder of this talk, um, let's get into some results. So uh, it's basically, basically broken up into two sections. I'm not gonna hit the third in the interest of time. Um, so we're going to first uh, downscale a reanalysis over the historical period. And in that, uh, we, we test uh, we conduct tests for a single water year in which we downscale reanalysis um, to determine an optimal set of physics and grid options within WARF. And then we use those, uh, we use uh, this step to inform uh, our physics choices as we downscale the entire historical period. Uh, and then in the end, we, we do this because we want to quantify biases and assess kind of uh, the fidelity of the product or confidence in the, in the downscale product. Uh, and so this figure on the left is just showing uh, some observations that we compare to. Uh, for precipitation in SWE, we'll compare to snow tell. For stream flow, we'll compare to gauges too. Uh, and then we also consider some subregions uh, as well across the Northern Rocky Mountains and then the Sierra Nevada. Uh, and then also some California coastal locations where we're considering uh, the temperature and the horizontal winds at 10 meters. So um, I'm going to just spend one slide presenting um, the results of our tests and don't try and read this too much. It's a lot to unpack. Um, we conducted 20 brute force tests uh, for water year 2010. Um, and these simulations, uh, we went chronologically from left to right uh, and evaluated biases in uh, precipitation on the top, uh, snow in the middle, uh, snow water equivalent on April 1 to be precise, uh, and then bottom stream flow. 
Uh, and then we each bar represents the bias of the simulation. Uh, and specifically, we're evaluating the performance of the nine kilometer uh, results. Um, and uh, moreover, we chose to modify options uh, as we proceeded through testing that were most likely to affect precipitation. So we played around with the cumulus parameterizations, we played around with microphysics, uh, we played around with nudging options. Um, and what we wanted to see was these bars getting smaller as we moved from left to right. And so this upper panel for precipitation, you see the bars reduce, being reduced in size as we move chronologically from left to right, um, indicating that the precipitation bias is being reduced. We see something similar in the middle panel for uh, April 1st snow water equivalent, uh, although we note the low bias in our final uh, domain configuration setup. Uh, and then interestingly enough for stream flow, um, uh, we actually tend to kind of worsen things as we move along. Now this may not be too surprising for the wharf hydro folks who um, it, if, if we note that there was no calibration uh, done in any of our tests. And also we were only spending the model up for a month um, and to appropriately capture um, the, the starting point uh, in hydrologic simulations, you oftentimes need years of spin up. Of course, we're not gonna do that here. Um, but just some notes from our tests, um, SWE and precipitation uh, in the end were most sensitive to nudging on the nine kilometer grid. And then the cumulus parameterization used. Actually, interestingly enough, microphysics didn't, didn't change our results too much whenever we tested it. Um, there, is some, uh, there is some evidence to support the idea that using ERA5 versus NAR, uh, which we used in the end for downscaling the full historical period, uh, was a good choice. Although uh, the tests where we, where, we, where we did this were not clean tests. Um, and so now, uh, once we've identified this finalized set of physics options and grid options, we then proceeded to downscale the entire 40 year period from 1980 to 2020. Um, and so we'll just start on the left with uh, figures A and figures F, subpanels A and F. Um, the biases uh, were, uh, in terms of magnitude, were the largest over the high terrain of the Western uh, US mountains. Um, and percent wise, the biases in the annual mean were you know, plus or minus 30%. Uh, but there was, there did seem to be a bit of a wet bias uh, driven, uh, especially across the southwestern United States, um, uh, due to a monsoon, the North American monsoon that was that was too strong. Um, and uh, if we if we turn our attention to the figure on the right, and we're starting to consider the resolution dependence uh, of our simulations across two uh, different uh, locales on the left, the Sierra Nevada, and on the right, the Northern Rockies, uh, and compared to Snowtel. Uh, which is the black curve. Wharf simulations are in red, uh, the solid curve, red curve being on the three kilometer domain, uh, the dash curve being on the nine kilometer domain, and then the dotted curve being on the 45 kilometer domain. We generally get a wetting of the solution as we go from 45 to nine kilometers. Makes sense, uh, more resolved terrain, stronger vertical velocities, and, and stronger precipitation as a result. Um, across the Sierra, uh, in our three kilometer runs, um, in the 40 year mean, um, we see that there's a um, excuse me. Uh, we see that there's a, about a twenty percent wet bias. Um, however, I would uh, caution interpreting this as a bias given undercatch issues associated with snowtel. Uh, although it appears the nine kilometer precipitation is kind of nailing it. Uh, and then as we move our uh, attention to the right across the northern Rockies, uh, and so most of these snowtel sites are across Wyoming. I think there are approximately sixty five. Um, uh, we see that the nine kilometer experiment actually is the most biased, and then once we downscale to three kilometers, from nine kilometers, we actually reduce that bias uh, quite a bit. But in short, the model is what I would classify as not out to lunch, um, uh, pending our downscaling of the entire 40 year period. And um, moving our attention now to snow, um, it makes sense that we're, you know, as we increase our resolution, we should be doing a better job. Uh, here we're showing springtime uh, snow water equivalent, uh, both across uh, the, the Sierra Nevada and the Northern Rockies, um, three kilometers is, is definitely giving us improvement. Um, and then we look at those same time series as we looked at before, uh, and the models are pretty much nailing uh, SWE on the three kilometer grids, uh, both across the Sierra Nevada uh, and across the Northern Rockies. I will point out uh, a slight weak, or a, what I would perceive to be a weakness in terms of Sierra Nevada snow, but we have this late melt-off bias by about uh, a week and a half. Um, so that was that was a little bit concerning, uh, but otherwise uh, we're we're pretty much nailing April first SWE. This can be shown by some of those statistics in the upper right, uh, upper left of the left, and the upper right of the right panel. So I hope I'm inspiring you with confidence that um, we are uh, downscaling it correctly.
Um, now, taking a look uh, at a couple of other items that we evaluated, I'm not going to get uh, into these uh, except to say that uh, the model uh, did a very nice job when considering very strong atmospheric rivers, uh, as well as the coastal meteorology across California. Uh, the, the latter of which uh, makes sense because we're improving the coastline representation and thus uh, the sea breeze, and you can expect improvements in temperature and the horizontal winds, which we did see. Um, so in summary, um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll lead off with item zero, which I didn't write down here. We also uh, found that uh, wharf uh, on the nine and three kilometer grids uh, did a, a superior job uh, to ERA-5 itself, as well as the 45 kilometer grid in simulating Santa Ana and Diablo winds. Um, and um, I must caution, even though we've downscaled this cool product over a 40 year period, um, it's not devoid of biases. And so uh, what we've gone through and done was we've quantified these biases, um, um, but the important thing the most important thing is that we attempted to reduce these. Now, there are, are, are better methods, I would argue, for going about it, uh, about reducing the biases. There are statistical methods. Uh, there are emulators that can be used. Uh, but we chose a brute force approach. Um, but once we have our downscale product, we now have a reference against which to compare uh, the GCM experiments that we'll get into shortly. Um, and um, just for your information, we have downscaled the back extension ERA-5 data from 1950 to 1979. Uh, and through September 1 of this year. Uh, so there's a complete 71 year uh, period, a quasi continuous uh, period. Uh, and these data are publicly accessible on Amazon S3 in an open bucket. Uh, try not to use them yet until the paper is, uh, paper is done with revisions. Um, so um, anyways, let's, let's transition now uh, from uh, more to more interesting matters, shall we? Uh, by looking at uh, uh, the downscaling of the GCMs. Uh, so just some eye candy on the left. Uh, these are uh, future changes in, in temperature uh, from four of our completed simulations um, from different emission scenarios, as well as a bias corrected uh, simulation there. Um, and this downscaling of GCMs, uh, this is where we're gonna get into the nuance of the methodology as it pertains to dynamical downscaling. Uh, and it begins with a GCM selection process, which is, as you're going to see, extremely important. Uh, and then we're going to get, we're going to finish with two items. Um, one dealing with uh, the impacts of pre downscaling or a priori bias correction. Uh, and then uh, we'll finish uh, with uh, comparing to existing methods, such as the pseudo global warming technique. Uh, I won't get into D in the interest of time. So, in terms of downscaling GCMs, I call it D downscaling the future, but we also downscale. Uh, pre-2015 in the CMIP-6 uh, ensemble, which technically are historical simulations. Um, and, and I cannot emphasize enough, this begins to deal fundamentally with this idea of garbage in, garbage out in modeling. Um, but even then we may have issues, but um, GCMs, as, as a colleague of mine puts it, simulate, uh, do a really good job at simulating the climate, but for it's for a, a slightly wrong planet. Um, and uh, it's, it's important from the very get-go to acknowledge what GCMs do well, and that is uh, grid-resolved processes. So those are going to involve hemispheric processes. Your GCM should be capturing those. Um, and then regional scale processes or synoptic scale processes. Um, your GCM that you downscale should be, you know, getting in the ballpark in terms of those metrics uh, or in terms of certain processes specific to your region. Uh, and so we thought a good place to start was through this wonderful paper uh, published last year by Simpson et al, um, in which uh, they uh, disguised a uh, CMIP-5 and CMIP-6 performance evaluation as a, CMIP, uh, as, as a CSM-2 evaluation paper. They did a wonderful job at, at, uh, at quantifying biases for certain processes uh, in, for, for, for all of these models all together in one paper. Uh, and they quantified these biases by uh, comparing the GCMs over the historical period uh, to ERA-5 uh, by considering the normalized mean square error, the equation is given there on the right, uh, and certain items of interest and relevant to our study that they looked at were metrics relevant to blocking, uh, 850 millibar winds and eddy meridional variants, uh, and then the 300 millibar um, eddy stream function. Uh, we also added some metrics of our own uh, in our process-based metricification, if you will, uh, which included wind shear, uh, uh, synoptic patterns uh, important for extreme precipitation events across California, uh, as well as uh, uh, Santa, Ana, Santa Ana synoptics, as I'll call it, and then uh, ENSO as well. 
Um, and um, following this metrification, we're going to uh, finish, uh, uh, we're going to develop a ranking uh, for which GCMs did the best. Now, independently uh, to the R ranking, uh, the folks at Scripps, collaborator, collaborators at Scripps, uh, did their own independent GCM evaluation, um, but that evaluation relied much more on actual GCM produced precipitation, whereas our metrics are, are focused more on the processes themselves that govern the precip, uh, as the precip, we would argue, is not, is not well resolved. So this effort on the GCM selection process uh, is led by Will Kronz on the top and Naomi Goldenson on the bottom there. Again, important to put pictures uh, with names. Uh, and uh, on the X, we, we, once we go through and we evaluate the metrics uh, for a given season, uh, for all of these different uh, processes uh, shown on the X axis, uh, for all the GCMs on the Y axis, uh, we get this checkerboard with, with brighter colors uh, indicative of more erroneous uh, metrics for a given GCM. Uh, now here, interesting, uh, here uh, what Will has done is he's ranked these GCMs uh, from bottom to top uh, in, uh, as we move towards the top, those GCMs tend to be the worst uh, in our initial ranking. Now of encouragement, uh, as a sanity check, we see more red GCMs at the bottom. These are CMIP6 GCMs indicating uh, if, you, if you anticipate there being improvement uh, in the GCM performance from CMIP5, to CMIP6, you're not disappointed when you look at this. However, one thing we note is many of these metrics are, are, are dependent on one another. Uh, so you can kind of think if shear is going to be proportional to the meridional temperature gradient and uh, therefore the meridional stream function. Uh, so what we go in and do, or what Will and Naomi have gone in and have done, is they, they address this idea of redundancy uh, in our metrics by considering a limited set of empirical orthogonal functions. Uh, and specifically, they use six to capture roughly 91% of the variance um, uh, across the models uh, in terms of their uh, contribution to the NMSC. Uh, weights are subs subsequently constructed, uh, and then these weights are applied uh, to the metrics and our ranking is redone. And when we do that, uh, our ranking does change. Uh, so uh, here we're, we're looking at the skill score, which is basically uh, uh, proportional to the Euclidean distance. Uh, smaller the Euclidean distance, the better. So the best performing GCMs are at the bottom. Um, and um, you can see these kind of groupings of GCMs um, as far as these brackets. Um, these groupings basically indicate GCMs that are not statistically distinguishable uh, from one another in terms of uh, how they performed in this ranking process. Um, and again, we see a lot of the CMIP6 GCMs bubbling to the top in terms of their performance. So once we have identified this GCM ranking, um, we go in and uh, we'll work our way left to right here. So um, we compare our ranking, uh, that's on the y-axis, uh, to the Scripps ranking. Um, and we closer values closer to the origin are better performing GCMs in, in both uh, sets of ranking setups. Um, however, I do want to spend a moment just pointing out that um, uh, if we if we take a look at um, uh, some values that performed really well uh, or simulations that performed very well in the uh, UCLA ranking but performed kind of poorly in the Scripps ranking, uh, these are simulations that got the right processes, the right regional dynamics in place as well as hemispheric dynamics, uh, but they for some reason didn't shoot out the precipitation that was uh, that the the Scripps that, that you would expect from those uh, simulations and thus they performed poorly in the Scripps ranking, ranking. And then we see kind of the reverse happening up here uh, as we move to the upper left of this panel where uh, GCMs did not appropriately represent the hemispheric and regional scale dynamics, uh, but for some reason they spat out good precipitation as evidenced by the Scripps ranking. Um, but a historical evaluation of these GCMs is not good enough. Um, we need to then move towards, towards the consideration of, of these available GCMs um, what G, how do the GCMs sample the future? So the axis, the X axis here is uh, the change in temperature in the future, uh, normalized by the warming, or excuse me, normalized by doubling of CO2. And then the Y axis is the same for precipitation. So we don't want to uh, dynamically downscale GCMs uh, that you know, have a really high climate sen sensitivity only, or GCMs that are all super wet in the future. We wanna, we wanna spread. Uh, and so the GCMs here that are fortunate enough to get their own kind of symbol, are GCMs from SSP370 and from SSP585. So these are upper tier emission scenarios that performed well in the historical period, 
uh, that we have the data to downscale for. And so as I'll get into in a moment, we've already downscaled uh, two of these in addition to a third GCM, uh, but our, our attention is now being focused on um, uh, F goals as well as UK ESM. Those are gonna be our next GCMs that we downscale. Um, so uh, this is kind of a checkerboard before I move into some of our downscaling results of what we have completed. Uh, so um, orange squares indicate uh, GCMs that have been downscaled without a priori bias correction. Black squares are GCMs that we have downscaled um, with a priori bias correction. And then just for fun, we've added in a pseudo global warming experiment, uh, which I'll make, uh, make some comparisons to here shortly. Um, and uh, we've also run some simulations, even though we've prioritized uh, SSP 370, uh, we have we've also conducted two simulations for alternative emission scenarios, namely for CSM2, SSPs 245 and 585. Uh, and then these are the GCMs that we've downscaled so far, CSM2, uh, MPI, ESM, uh, and then CNRM from France. And all of these GCMs are downscaled from 1980 to 2100, continuous, well, quasi-continuously. Um, so uh, I want to make one final note here, um, and that is, uh, the check mark indicates that we've downscaled that given simulation to all grids. The goal is to go down to, to, to three kilometers. Uh, the remainder of the experiments that don't have the check mark have been downscaled only to nine kilometers. And the reason for this is we have not made up our minds whether we uh, intend to, to downscale future simulations with a priori bias correction, because there are certain uh, issues that are raised uh, whenever you do so. So with that, this is a great time to lead into bias correction and our downscaling efforts. Um, so um, there is only really one a priori bias correction technique that I've, I've seen in the literature. Uh, I would love to hear your thoughts after the fact or after this talk as far as other potential bias correction techniques that are out there uh, in dynamical downscaling. But um, the, the, method, uh, the methods of uh, Cindy Briere et al. Uh, from 2014 uh, are, are, are really, really uh, cool because they, they're, they're simple. Um, this, this process begins by considering a variable X uh, from the GCM, and we decompose this variable X uh, into its mean, which the climate mean is uh, taken here to be 1980 to 2014, uh, that mean plus the deviation from the mean. And then we take some reference data set, such as ERA5, and we do the same with it. And then we go in and we say, Okay, the GCM, the bias corrected GCM signal is going to be the original GCM signal plus or shifted rather by a delta. And that delta is uh, defined to be the climatological biases between the reference and the GCM. And so what you're left with is the GCM bias corrected signal goes as the reanalysis based state plus the GCM deviation. And in this process, um, it's assumed that in this GCM prime term that it contains the GCM variability, the trend, uh, the changes in the trend, and, or excuse me, the, the trend, the variability, the changes in the mean, and the changes in the variability, which is a big assumption to make. Um, and we apply this bias correction to uh, the, the three-dimensional horizontal winds, temperature, geopotential. Different from Briere at all, we did this with, we applied it to spe uh, specific humidity and not relative humidity. Uh, and then also we, we applied it to the sea surface temperatures. Okay. So for the rest of this talk, because we haven't made our minds up what uh, grids or what technique we're going to proceed with, uh, we're going to spend the remainder of the talk on the nine kilometer grid. So what's shown here is a little eye candy to lead off. Um, on the left, we're looking at the springtime two meter temperature trend. Uh, and on the right, we're looking at the wintertime uh, precipitation trend in respective units per century. Um, and um, on top is the no bias correction uh, trends. Uh, and the bottom shows the without, or excuse me, with bias correction trends. Um, and as we just kind of like, uh, kind of move our eyes from left to right, uh, we see that, you know, it looks like the, the largest differences uh, in the trends are uh, between different GCMs being downscaled versus if we bias correct, uh, it seems like the trends uh, for a given GCM uh, are more similar. And this is the same thing for precipitation as well. Um, that's good, that makes me happy, that makes me think that bias correction is viable. Uh, but let me show you all a, a difference plot. Let's just turn our attention solely to temperature now. Uh, if we look at the trend differences uh, in springtime, 
Um, there are a lot of differences that show up on the top here. Um, we're showing the absolute change in the trends uh, in degrees C per century. And then on the bottom, it's a percent change. Um, and what we see, uh, there are a lot of differences between these figures again, but there are some similarities. And namely, what we're going to look at uh, are that the bias corrected GCMs tend to have warmer trends across some of these mountain ranges. Um, and the Sierra, um, some of the interior Rockies, and even the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and this is a common feature uh, of all of these GCMs. Uh, and so this makes me think that since we are talking about springtime when the snow albedo feedback is kicking off, uh, this is snow related. Now, interestingly enough, if I show you the differences across uh, three mountain ranges uh, in this domain where we're seeing the warmer trends, uh, these plots are showing the difference in SWE by month and by climate period, whether it's historical, mid-century or end of century, the difference is in snow water equivalent between the bias corrected and non-bias corrected experiments. And what they're showing is that it doesn't matter which simulations you're talking about, which GCM you're talking about, we see that uh, snow water equivalent is simulated to be much less in the bias corrected experiments, like a lot less. And so this is where we started in terms of trying to parse out why the trends were warmer um, in the bias corrected experiments. And as you can see here from this bottom panel here on the figure on the left, uh, we're talking about 10 to 20% differences. And, and energy uh, and utility companies care about these, these trend differences. If we talk about you know, 1C, 1.5C, 2C world, uh, these percent differences manifest as 0.5 to 1C differences in the trend. So we need to get to the bottom of which one may be more physically real, uh, realistic. So that snow bias comes uh, presumably via precipitation biases. So if we look at the historical uh, time series of, of snow tell compared to reanalysis. Uh, the reanalysis is doing just fine as we showed earlier as well on our reanalysis driven runs. And then we downscale the GCMs and look at that same time period in the climate mean uh, and uh, compared to snow tell, the GCMs are simulating almost 75% uh, more precip especially in MPI ASM, and especially uh, in about 20 to 30% more, uh, even more so uh, in CSM2. Uh, so these, these, these spring snow biases are being driven by wintertime wet biases uh, in precipitation. And as we'll see in a moment, these are coming fundamentally from the GCM. When we bias correct a priori and then downscale, and we look at these curves for the bias corrected runs, CSM2 gives us a historical daily uh, precipitation uh, curve that is a lot closer to snow tell ops. Uh, and MPI, as we note, is still wet biased by about 20%, especially in, uh, in February. Uh, but we're reducing the magnitudes of these biases. And that it begins to explain why we're getting so much less snow, uh, and I would argue more realistic snow in the bias corrected experiments. So returning to this figure, um, what, and, and let's, let's, let's actually put a physical story to this. So we know the snow amounts are way too high uh, in the bias corrected experiments or in the non-bias corrected experiments, excuse me, due to the preceding winter's wet bias. And this manifests as double the sweep and 50% more precipitation. Um, and uh, as we think about this for a given energy input, what's happening? Well, um, as we move into March, April, May, um, we, it, for in a given energy input into the surface, uh, if there's more snow in a given simulation, more energy has to be diverted to melting that snow. And as we know, that's an isothermal process. And less of that energy is going to make its way uh, into being absorbed by the ground and sensibly heating the overlying atmosphere. Um, since there is less snow in the bias corrected experiments, um, more of that energy as the climate warms from year to year uh, can be uh, absorbed by the ground and then used to heat the uh, overlying air sensibly. And this shows up in the sensible heat uh, to atmosphere trends. Uh, so if you just direct your attention to the title of the slide or title of the sub panel, um, and we look at the bias corrected experiments as given by the B, and we compare it to their non bias corrected experiments, the sensible heat trends uh, are much warmer uh, in the bias corrected experiments, whether it's CSM2 or MPI. Uh, than their non-bias corrected counterparts. And so this explains why the trends are so much warmer uh, across this mountainous terrain during March, April, May. Uh, 
So um, now this begs the question, why the heck is there too much precipitation to begin with in all downscaled simulations so far? Um, well, um, let's look at uh, vertical cross sections upstream of the Western US. Um, and specifically here, you're looking at various simulations differences from ERA5, or rather ERA5 is subtracted from uh, a given GCM. So uh, we, we, we do this for specific humidity, temperature, and then the horizontal components of the wind U and V. And what do we see? So I want you all to pay primary, uh, primarily pay attention to uh, the solid curves, uh, which, or, uh, which are from GCMs, uh, directly from the GCMs. The gray curve is CNRM, the red curve is MPI ESM, and the blue curve is CSM2. And what do we see? Um, well, all of the models are generally moister than ERA5. We see that all of the models have too much low level instability relative to ERA5. And particularly for CNRM, look how cold it is in the middle and upper troposphere. Uh, but all these models have this cold bias. We have a strong shear bias uh, in, in the GCM. Again, the GCM is being, is being fed to wharf. Um, now, the one exception for the strong shear bias is in the V component of the wind uh, as, it, as it is simulated in CNRM. Uh, however, overall, too much moisture, too much instability, too much shear, too much precipitation. And if we assume a steady state atmosphere, we assume that these features are going to advect from just upstream of the Western US over the Western US, um, that, that, that begins to explain this, uh, this bias. Um, and I guess, you know, we're looking at a 35-year mean here. This is an aside, but we're looking at a 35-year mean here. I expected these differences to be much less, uh, especially because we're simulating, uh, we're, we're, we're looking at these biases over open ocean where you would assume the models to be, I guess, more similar. There aren't, you know, big, large terrain differences, driving differences in simulated meteorology and climate. Um, but anyway, so this is just one little flavor that we're exploring so far uh, as a bias correction goes in dynamical downscaling. And once, we, once we've kind of made up our minds with whether to or whether not to bias correct a priori as we move forward, uh, we'll, we'll try and put this together in some type of, of, of write-up. Um, so let's, uh, for the remainder of this talk, um, just kind of uh, focus on uh, how our direct approaches, so direct dynamical downscaling compares with pseudo-global warming techniques. Um, we're, this is still very much a work in progress, uh, but we are looking at it. Um, and just to note, to assuage any fears, um, so uh, we're, we're looking at CSM2 here, same realization uh, for uh, a 20 year period. Uh, these and deltas are computed uh, using the last 20 years of the 20th and 21st centuries, and they're subsequently added um, to uh, the ERA5 experiment simulated from 1980 to, to 2000. Uh, and I might add that these deltas are computed monthly and then applied to ERA5 via linear interpolation. Bias corrections actually perform the same way. Uh, and then um, finally, just to, to uh, let you know, we are looking at the exact same time periods here. Uh, in comparing the raw GCMs uh, via direct dynamical downscaling to PGW, we're comparing the exact same uh, time periods. Uh, and here's just a little labeling information for you all. The PGW experiment uh, refers to the pseudo global warming experiment. Uh, the direct dynamical downscaling or direct experiment refers to downscaling without a priori bias correction. And then direct plus BC uh, refers to the simulation uh, where we have applied a priori uh, bias correction. Okay, so I'm just going to spend one slide on this uh, with three little animations. And we're gonna go through annual mean precipitation uh, deltas. So the change, so future minus present day uh, precipitation. Annual mean precipitation, the change in the 99th percentile of precipitation, uh, and then the percent change of 99th percentile precipitation. Um, and um, as expected, um, the dynamical downscaling preserves the this is the large scale signal of CSM2 uh, in the lower right. Um, although I will say its trends are, are much wetter uh, across the Pacific Northwest. And we're, we're seeing, of course, uh, a high degree of heterogeneity to the result. Um, so I, I, wanna, I wanna make this, make this pitch. Um, if, you look, if you're used to looking at global climate models uh, and, their, and their output, um, if you see three very similar, seemingly similar plots, 
uh, for the direct for the downscaling results, uh, you might say to yourself, "Oh, those look very similar. Like, I think we can just use either one of them. Let's use the computationally uh, most computationally cheap experiment." Um, but I think we need to really get into the mindset of of scrutinizing the spatial detail. So, for instance, in the direct dynamical downscaling simulation, uh, we see that the Sierra, the spine of the Sierra, are much wetter. Uh, in terms of the future changes in annual mean precipitation than either the PGW um, or the direct dynamical downscaling experiment. Meanwhile, across the southwestern US, there's a, a drier future uh, in the PGW experiment that doesn't really show up as well uh, in the two direct methods. Um, which one is right? I don't know. Uh, but let's turn our attention now to 99th percentile precipitation. Again, we're seeing a case of the GCM's uh, signal being preserved to some degree uh, in either three of these downscaling uh, uh, simulations. Um, I will say that uh, there is a more noticeable area of divergence between the two dynamical downscaling uh, direct methods and then the PGW experiment in which uh, the future changes in the 99th percentile uh, precipitation are much more extreme across uh, the upslope of Washington and uh, the Olympics and the rainforest area. Um, and then indeed, if we look at the percent changes, um, I would say that they're actually uh, on the large scale quite similar um, to the GCM, especially uh, in the direct methods, uh, a little bit more uh, of a divergence across the Pacific Northwest uh, in the PGW experiment. Uh, but again, um, while these may seemingly be similar uh, on the large scale, I think we again need to be really uh, scrupulous uh, and uh, really ask ourselves the question of what is right and where is it right? And so these, these analyses can begin to kind of uh, push, um, move the needle on that question. So um, an overview of what we just talked about in terms of bias correction and, and pseudo-global warming. Um, so bias correction, um, it modifies the trends in physical ways um, by reducing biases in the mean climate. Um, and um, it's really cool doing this in a, this kind of an this kind of experiment in a, in a dynamical downscaling framework because uh, different from statistical downscaling frameworks, we can use physics to explain the differences uh, and the impacts of bias correction. Whereas in statistical downscaling frameworks, uh, we cannot. Now, um, I must say that the variability of the input GCM uh, is subtly modified um, upon bias correction. And the question of does a small change in the GCM forcing data uh, variability manifest as really large changes in the downscale products variability. That's a question that we're, we're working actively to get at right now. Um, as for our work, uh, I think I'm going to make the pitch uh, that we should be sticking with an a priori bias correction step uh, for, for, multiple, for multiple reasons, um, especially uh, a bias correction in which the dynamical fields are modified. And by dynamical, I mean the, the horizontal winds and the geopotential. Um, the reason for this is we ran tests in which we only bias corrected certain variables, um, namely the thermodynamic fields, which were identified to be important in the Briere et al. study. Uh, and we found that it actually didn't reduce the historical biases that we had been seeing all that much. Uh, and it kind of makes sense, right? We're talking about in the Briere et al. study, they were looking at tropical cyclones, we're looking at uh, Western US weather and climate, which is driven by, by large scale uh, landfalling waves. Uh, and then building off of two, um, I, think, I think this can, can shed some light on what bias correction is actually doing for us. Um, so uh, as an example, GCMs diagnose the vertical velocity through various methods, kinematic, adiabatic, et cetera. Um, and um, therefore they somewhat diagnose a component of the thermal field. Um, and so what bias correction is effectively doing is it's kind of uh, translating the GCM signal into a language the RCM can deal with. Um, uh, an interesting um, metaphor, um, just came up with it. Um, anyways, um, but I think that bias correction, um, recall that uncertainty map that I showed in the thesis slide, which broke down the components of uncertainty uh, via internal variance scenario and then model uncertainty. I, I, I figure there could be a fourth column there, especially as it pertains to dynamical downscaling that deals with the impacts of bias correction. So where is bias correction increasing or decreasing our uncertainty? Um, and then finally, uh, a note about the pseudo-global warming uh, approach. 
and how it compares to direct methods. Well, uh, from a large scale standpoint, it's quite comparable, although there's some larger differences locally. Uh, honestly, I was pleasantly surprised to see the similarities between the pseudo global warming approach and our direct downscaling approach. Uh, and this bodes well for the National Climate Assessment, which of course is using warming levels, uh, i.e. a pseudo global warming approach. So to finish up here, uh, one more slide, um, our vision. And um, I, think, I think our vision can be summarized up into this idea that I think hybrid downscaling is, 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 the, is what lies in store over the next 20 years. Um, before uh, we get to the point where we have GCMs that can resolve the whole globe at you know, convective permitting scales. Um, and this is gonna require us uh, to take RCMs, which of course give us the nice physics that we want in our downscaling and combine it with statistical downscaling, which allows us to um, downscale large ensembles, because of course we're interested in the spread of the climate change signal and the uncertainty. Um, and marry these two frameworks into that hybrid downscaling approach, which is currently the work uh, that uh, I'm a part of with uh, through the, funded through the California Energy Commission and folks at Scripps where we're entertaining the idea or we're actually exploring uh, how to get WARF uh, downscale data into the uh, to a statistical downscaling model, specifically LOCA. Um, and uh, we, we're not sure exactly how that's going to manifest. Is this going to manifest? Are we just going to use the WARF downscaled output to train LOCA? Uh, or are we going to use the WARF output to develop uh, modifications for those uh, statistical relationships between the large scale predictor fields and those high resolution predict ANDs that I mentioned? Uh, but I definitely don't think that one or the other is the future. I think a combination of both is the future. And I, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, and then more generally, and I, I really, really believe strongly in this. Um, I think that there, I, I, I don't just want to do. Uh, Western US. This needs to be CONUS. Uh, so again, it's it's more selfish than in a cortex. Uh, and this needs to be uh, every five years or six years whenever the CMIP is uh, CMIP is updated. Uh, and, and this kind of uh, selfishness will allow us to kind of put out a product uh, that can, you know, not leave anybody out here in the United States. Um, and it can serve as a, uh, from the GCM selection process to the refined techniques um, of the downscaling process, whether it's on the dynamical or statistical downscaling side of things, it can serve as a template for other modeling groups around the planet who are trying to, you know, get a handle on, on downscaling as a practice. So um, anyways, with that, I appreciate your time. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and uh, take questions. Okay, thank you, Stefan, for the great talk. Um, I'm sure there are some questions. So if, if you'd like to ask a question, you can Type it in the chat or you can raise your hand if you're in the Zoom room and we can call on you. Um, I do see one question in the um, on the public page. So question is, does LOCA have a higher spatial resolution than the current WARF setting? Uh, the answer is uh, trick. Well, it's, it's not as easy as a yes or no. Uh, the wharf grid, or excuse me, the loca grid is at six kilometers. So yes, it's higher than anything I uh, showed on the nine kilometer grid, but our three kilometer grid uh, is uh, obviously over a more limited area, but it, it is higher resolution. Okay, um, don't see any in the Zoom room. I, I've got a couple of questions. Um, the first question I had was, oh, I see James just raised his hand. You can go ahead, James. Okay, um, really enjoyed your talk. Um, we've dealt with the bias correction um, conundrum in the past, and I was curious to understand a little bit better as to why um, you still haven't decided whether or not you want to use that moving forward since it looked like it gave you much better results in the tests that you've done so far. Yeah, um, so you're right. The historical means were significantly improved. Uh, and if that were the only, um, if that were the only uh, mission we were on to, to improve the historical means, we would stick with bias correction. However, um, there are um, uh, other considerations that are not so uh, straightforward. For instance, this idea that um, when you bias correct, um, you are doing two things. One, um, you are 
uh, breaking the relationships between the variables that are driving your model, um, which may already have been done in the reanalysis, but I'm talking about the GCMs. Um, you're breaking the relationship between the variables in the model. Uh, and then two, uh, when you bias correct the GCM input, um, you are changing the variability of, of, of the GCM. So if you were to take a time series at a given point uh, over like a 10 year period of temperature at like 500 millibars, uh, and then just look at the raw GCM signal and then look at the bias corrected signal, they would not, A, they would not match and B, their, their variances uh, as well as their means would be, would be different. And so how that transforms whenever we dynamically downscale, uh, that, that, that uncertainty gets convoluted in the downscaling process. Um, and um, the reason I think I am posturing a little bit for the use of uh, a priori uh, bias correction uh, is of course the historical means are improved. Um, but also um, as far as our, our modeling setup where we're parallelizing the years, um, we're getting so much snow in some of these experiments, particularly in uh, our already completed three kilometer experiment, which I didn't show, uh, that it's not melting off by the time we get to our next year. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's leading to these weird discontinuities that in are, are unphysical um, and uh, uh, I don't like. Yeah. Sorry, I wanted to answer to a very simple question. Thank you so much. No, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a complicated problem and I'm aware of some of those issues that you mentioned. So yeah, I, I, thank you very much. Sure, my pleasure. Uh, Chang Hai? Uh, yes, uh, this is Chang Hai. Uh, um, I have, I think uh, uh, many questions and in particular, you know, uh, uh, about your uh, model, you know, sensitivities and some, you know, maybe detailed um, uh, uh, Wolf model configuration and but uh, anyway here I just ask uh, you a different uh, uh, question I, not a question maybe a comment I think uh, the com the comparison between you know PGA and uh, direct downscaling is uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, uh, very interesting uh, but the results are GCM dependent in the, for example if the GCM projected you know a little change in storm tracks uh, we can imagine maybe the PGW and direct downscaling may, you know, produce uh, relatively maybe similar results. Or if the, you know, storm track, uh, you know, the projected storm track is very different between the current and future climate, we may expect a bigger difference between the, P, uh, the PGW and the direct, uh, you know, downscaling. And also, you know, according to your plan, looks like your group, your team, you know, probably is going to downscale many uh, GCMs. So I think that that's, a lot, that's a lot of work. So, uh, you know, however, if you use the, you know, PSW approach, uh, you know, maybe only, you know, a, a single simulation is, you know, uh, needed. So have you thought about that? You know, uh, you know me and, uh, you know, I, not only myself and our, you know, NCAR water system team is, uh, you know, uh, have done a lot of PW simulations. We are maybe a big fan of PW approach. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah so um, thank you so much for, for the questions. Um, and I'll just say to begin, uh, your 2017 and 2018 papers, uh, I'm a big fan of. And we, we actually drew inspiration in our initial set of uh, wharf options from, from, your, from your methodologies, albeit yours were on a convective allowing three kilometer or four kilometer you know, entire Western or entire US grid. Um, so uh, getting at your questions, um, uh, one, um, I think that um, you're exactly right about the, the pseudo global warming comparisons. Um, and I do think that there's merit in running more pseudo global warming experiments. Um, however, um, pseudo global warming uh, experiments by themselves will not allow you to get at questions of time of, time of emergence. Uh, you won't be able to look at changes in variability. In fact, you're, you're running with the, the, the historical climate variability in those pseudo global warming experiments. Um, and so I think that is the, the, the rationale behind going the direct approach. Now, um, having said that, as a pseudo global warming implementer yourself, um, I would be, at least from what I've seen so far, I, I would be kind of 
encouraged by the fact that, uh, at least from some of those very preliminary figures I showed, that the PGW experiment is comparing so favorably with the direct approach. Um, so uh, at first, you know, I we were, I try to be as impartial uh, as as I can to matters of science when I first go into them. Uh, my first impression was that we were going to see massive and obvious differences right off the get go from looking at pseudo global warming in comparisons to uh, direct downscaling. And the fact that we didn't see as obvious and massive differences, I think says something about the correctness of the approach. Now, I will say this as well. So indirect dynamical downscaling, uh, whether it's the direct uh, or the bias corrected direct, um, we, uh, we of course allowed the moisture to change in time. Um, which is done implicitly in most pseudo global warming techniques. In, in specifically, they uh, they'll 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 use a conserved uh, RH. Obviously, Q will go up, but but RH stays the same. Uh, so it's kind of an artificial increase uh, in the moisture um, in pseudo global warming techniques uh, in accordance with Clausius Clapeyron. Uh, that is not done here, um, and so um, I think there are going to be certain instances where. I think I would tend to intuitively trust the direct method more than the PGW, but there are a lot of similarities uh, as we're as we're finding. So anyway, sorry, long winded answer again. My apologies, and thank you for your question. Yeah, thank you. I think that um, you know the the similarities maybe is you know due to the uh, you know dominant uh, thermal dynamic you know impact in the, in the future warmer climate. I have more questions. I think I already registered, you know, the leader. <laughs> please, please email me. And, and I actually have a comment if uh, before any other questions. These data cannot be analyzed by any one person. Uh, we're, we're, we've, we've only downscaled, gosh, like eight GCMs at this point from four different modeling centers. Um, and it's, 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 it's enough. It's more data you can shake a stick at. So we're, we're moving these data to Amazon S3. Um, and we've already moved uh, some of the data there, including the historical reanalysis, um, because this is intended to be a data set that's used by the community. And I'm not trying to step on the toes of Cortex, but again, we're just more we're more selfish than than Cortex, as our as our grids kind of indicate. Anyways. Okay, thank you. I think we have time for one more question, and it was asked by Senlin. I think he's still in here. So Senlin, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, Stephen. Um, nice to see your presentation. Um, so I, I'm just curious about the better performance from the nine kilometer wolf simulation um, than like compared to the three kilometer simulations. Uh, um, you showed uh, in a couple of uh, like sweet and the precipitation comparison. Um, can you share some insights on that? Say like the potential reasons for that. Yeah. Uh, so. Um... I, I can actually I can pull up the slides or I can just answer um, without without doing so. So um, uh, one thing uh, at the snowtail locations um, across the western U.S. where we were you know doing our SWE evaluations in the nine kilometer experiment there was uh, about a seventy five meter uh, low bias in the elevation of the grid cells, um, which can do two things. One that'll change your temperature. Uh, of the grid cells on the nine kilometer grid that may make them preferentially warm uh, compared to you know, a higher resolution grid where you're getting much closer to the observed topography. And then two, um, you may have, um, this may change your precipitation type of those grid cells. So we, we generally saw, and, and again, it's dependent on region, but we generally saw an increasing in the wetness and the increasing in the SWE values uh, across the various subregions we looked at. Obviously, uh, the Northern Rocky Mountains was uh, an exception where we actually saw a wetter nine kilometer solution, both in terms of precipitation and SWE uh, than we did across the Sierra. So um, has to do with, again, I guess concisely put, has to do with the elevation differences uh, on the three kilometer versus nine kilometer grid, uh, coupled with uh, potential impacts on precipitation. Thanks. Yeah, of course. All right. Well, thank you, Stefan. Oh, sorry. Sorry to cut you off there. Um, yeah, thank you for um, just a, a really great seminar. And um, also thanks, uh, thanks everyone for the questions. And there was um, also another, another comment here in the chat. Unfortunately, we have to um, sign off. Um, so 
again, um, if you are interested in giving a Ralph seminar or inviting uh, a colleague from another institution like UCLA, like Stefan, um, please contact me, Jared Lee at ucard.edu, and you can Google the RAL seminar series webpage to see uh, prior recordings. Uh, and also for the CGD seminars, the, the seminar coordinator for that series is Dan Ammerhein. Um, you, you can Google the CGD seminar series page as well, although right now the servers seem to be down, so maybe try again a little later today. Uh, so unfortunately, I don't know when the next one is happening. But again, thank you everyone for joining and um, I hope you have a good rest of your day and a good rest of your week. And thank you again, Stefan. Thanks for having me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tim. See you all later.